We are in the condition we are in, in the state of ignorance we are in, in the state of war, in the state of economic depression, in the state of depletion of the resources of our planet because of the greed of psychopaths who thought they could create their own reality. Well, look at the reality they created. You're listening to Stop Talk Radio, the world for people who think. Hi, and welcome to Stop Talk Radio. It's been almost 50 years since the assassination of JFK and 60 years since the suicide of Dr. Frank Olson. These are two intertwined events that speak volumes about the true nature of the so-called Cold War. Our guest in this week's show is American journalist and author Hank P. Alberelli Jr., whose detailed investigations into these murders have shed much light on the decidedly murky activities of the CIA and friends. Hank Alberelli is a founding member of the North American Truth and Accountability Commission on Human Experimentation, which seeks to raise public awareness about historical and ongoing human rights violations in North America, and works to establish an accurate and truthful historical record of such crimes, including human trafficking, organized ritual crime, child soldiering, mind control experimentation, and other forms of torture in both the private and public spheres. Alberelli is the author of A Terrible Mistake, The Murder of Frank Olson and the CIA's Secret Cold War Experiments, which documents and details numerous CIA and Pentagon-sponsored experiments on unwitting human subjects, and also A Secret Order, investigating the high strangeness and synchronicity in the JFK assassination. The second book explores the many little-known yet intriguing aspects surrounding the murder of President Kennedy. Yeah. Well, I just want to say that having read one of those two books, it is incredibly detailed. <clears throat> it's almost 900 pages long. Uh, a, t- a terrible mistake is about the death of Frank Olson. It's nearly, in fact, it's split up into five books, and it goes into a lot of detail. Anyway, mm-hmm. welcome to the show. Ah, thank you. Uh, did you hear a little introduction there? I did. I, okay. I'm not sure I heard it all, but <laughs> okay. I heard some of it. Okay. Well, um, we, um, yeah, I mean, as I've just said, we're basically here to discuss uh, the contents of, of both of your books. And uh, mm-hmm. I mean, right off, right off the bat, I just want to say that, that both of them are, are pretty amazing in, in both the scope of the investigation and the extent to which they paint a picture of an extremely complex and often bizarre web of interlocking <laughs> individuals and government agencies. I mean, and all of it ultimately seems to, to tie back, if, if only indirectly, to either the plans to murder JFK, the murder itself, or the fallout afterwards. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I suppose that's why maybe you chose to include the term high strangeness in the title of the Secret Order? Uh, partially, yes. Uh, I, uh, th- there is a fair amount of high strangeness and synchronicity. I think some of it uh, escapes people who, who aren't ultra-familiar with, uh, with the, the Kennedy case, but, uh, but the use of the word satisfied me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and one specificity <clears throat> of the secret order is that uh, you go beyond the official story, beyond uh, mm-hmm. what has been said and repeated by uh, most researchers, and you mm-hmm. kind of complement and dig further and treat points that have been overlooked or ignored mm-hmm. by uh, other researchers. So it gives uh, a lot of extra material to connect the dot and have a, a more comprehensive understanding of what has been going on around the GFK assassination. Well, th- that's correct. Uh, it's, I, I, became, I first became interested in the Kennedy assassination uh, in a, sort of a passive sort of way when I was researching uh, my book on Dr. Frank Olson and his murder. And fairly often uh, in that research and in writing that book, uh, I would trip over links 
connections between between Olson's murder um, and and the assassination of and Kennedy's assassination. Primarily, I mean, the reason for that primarily was because of the the common names uh, between the two the two cases. Most of those names being people that were connected directly or indirectly with the CIA. But in conducting my research uh, on the Olson book, uh, I was uh, consistently warned by people to to other researchers and other writers to if at all possible, to stay away from the Kennedy assassination um, uh, because it it's basically a black hole in terms mm-hmm. of research. Uh, uh, you, you delve into it, and the, there there seems to be no bottom whatsoever. The the deeper you go, the the deeper the hole becomes. The mm-hmm. the more you research, the the more it leads, you know, into into side avenues and and additional rabbit holes but uh and and I tried to adhere to that advice because uh you know I had experience through friendships with other researchers who had who had fallen into that trap but eventually it became more than more than an apparent it it became more than apparent to me that that uh, just out of my just to satisfy my own curiosity uh, I would have to do more research mm-hmm. uh, into the Kennedy assassination as it related to uh, to, to Frank Olson and, and the CIA in general, and and that's the primary reason I I wrote the book A Secret Order. Um, it was you know it was not an attempt to to try to get to 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 the bottom or to solve the Kennedy assassination. I I really had no interest in that. I don't think. Mm-hmm. I don't think Kennedy's assassination, you know, going on 50 years now, I don't think it'll ever be solved, to to be perfectly blunt. And, mm-hmm. it and depends, I frankly, guess. if it were to be solved, uh, I don't think I don't think most people in the so-called conspiracy community would would be satisfied with any with any alleged truthful answer or explanation that would come out i think i think there may be additional there may be additional documents released i think Mm -hmm. any additional documents will just further the depths of the of the rabbit hole but in terms Mm -hmm. of in terms of the u.s government providing anything that's going to uh explain away what what now stands as the official story um that's not going to happen uh, for 50 years, we've been told by this government, by the U.S. government, that that Lee Harvey Oswald uh, killed JFK, and and uh, and it would be beyond remarkable if if the if this government were to step away from that and and provide mm-hmm. any sort of alternative explanation. There may be a little bit more to the story uh, that will probably eventually come out. Uh, but I think I think what we have in the body of the the Warren Commission report is is basically what we're going to be left with. Well, I think that amongst all the books that have been written on it, um, including yours, I think anybody who reads even a portion of those uh, can be left in no doubt that it was not the Harvey Oswald, and it was some aspect or some element within the U.S. You know, within the U.S. government, and I mean, what more do you need? Do you really need all the specifics? Sure, they'd be interesting, but well, I think you know, I in a in a perfect world, it would it would be good to have it would be good to have an explanation as close to specific as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't think any murder in the history of the world has been studied no. in more detail than than the Kennedy assassination, but I think. Ironically, the 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 tremendous amount of study and research that's gone into the Kennedy Kennedy assassination has primarily served just to make the uh, make the waters all the more murky. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the reason for that is there's just there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of pure junk out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, 
by design that, maybe. that purports to to explain you know the assassination i think and and there's various flavors of the of the month and flavors of the year right now uh uh right now a theory that's that's really in vogue is uh that l b j Lyndon Baines Johnson president Lyndon Baines Johnson was behind the assassination i don't I don't subscribe to that at all but i think mm-hmm. i think you're going to see a fair amount of a fair amount of publications over the next year that go off in that direction but uh it's but in terms of oswald like i think there's there's more to the oswald story there there's no doubt mm-hmm. about that there's there's tremendous gaps and in, in holes in his biography his official and, and unofficial biography again there's a lot of junk that that clouds uh you know f- facts factual information about Oswald but i think we can le- we can learn a lot more if if indeed the government has that information but uh mm-hmm. but I, I think at this point in time that's a big assumption yeah well just speaking of the rabbit hole and you know books like the ones that you've written that give those kind of very strange details um, it, I kind of found it kind of funny to think that because of the preponderance of the whole uh, CIA kind of uh, research MK Ultra into into uh, you know mind altering mm-hmm. drugs and stuff mm-hmm. that reading the details the the bizarre and uh, details around uh, the case of Frank Olson and and that whole topic and the Kennedy assassination it kind of sometimes started to make me feel like I was on some kind of mind altering drug you know what I mean. <laughs> Uh, just just reading yeah. about it, you know. So I thought that was quite, quite, uh, yeah. quite appropriate in a way. It, it's like that for us but to read it. We can only imagine. You what use it the like word. You to use study the it. word bizarre in your introduction, and and it's certainly a lot of what was happening back then in the 1950s and 1960s was was certainly bizarre. I'm sure it's equally bizarre today. I think mm-hmm. the intelligence community in this country has become much more adept at at keeping things secret and yep. and uh and well away from the public uh i think they learned their lessons well in the 1970s when when all the exposures and revelations about mk ultra and mk naomi and the various the various mm-hmm. uh sub projects came out and so there's there's very little that sees the light of day today but but what was going on back then was was certainly bizarre I have a question about that, because from uh, from reading your books and uh, other mm-hmm. researchers' book, you end up with the impression that already in the fifties, just for, from the declassified uh, CIA documents, which is only the emerged part of the iceberg, you mm-hmm. get the impression that already at this time, it's more than fifty, it's uh, sixty years ago, mm-hmm. the CIA had a lot of stuff. Uh, was involved in a lot of organizations, hospitals, research centers, jails, hotels, universities, uh, journal, uh, yeah, uh, mm-hmm. journalists, medias, and uh, and they were pretty advanced in those uh, techniques, brainwashing techniques, those drugs, mm-hmm. this, uh, and all that. So mm-hmm. I'm wondering if what we know about the CIA in the 50s is maybe 10 or 5 percent of what they were doing at the time. What are they doing now? The, I was trying to to imagine the volume, the, the magnitude. Uh, they, uh, do they have armies of uh, brainwashed people? Or how do you picture the the magnitude of the brainwashing uh, effort and techniques developed by the CIA today? Well, there's there's a couple questions there that that are that are important it's in the 50s and in the 60s yes they they did contract with virtually virtually every prominent university in the united states and there you know there's there's a few hundred universities in the united states and i think we know from from the the scant files we have uh that of the, I think the count of universities alone and this is excluding colleges and and other research institutions uh is probably about 140 universities that were contracted 
directly just under MK Ultra. Uh, if you include MK Naomi, there's probably an additional 50 or 60 universities, some some the same as MK Ultra, some not uh, in research institutions that were involved. But to to bring it up to date. I think I think the answer in terms of what's going on today, as compared to the 50s and 60s, uh, the answer bluntly is that it's much more expansive mm-hmm. uh, in terms of the the numbers, the number of educational fa- uh, facilities that are under contract. Uh, but in a lot of those cases, uh, th- those contracts are let through. Uh, front organizations, front foundations, mm-hmm. front research institutes. So, some of those, some of those university people, those university researchers and scientists, would be unwitting of the fact that that they were working directly or indirectly for the CIA, and and some would be witting. It really depends on on the nature of the project and and the oh. extent of interaction between the agency. Uh, and the and whatever research facility or institution is involved, uh, uh, you know, on complex projects, uh, the monitoring has to be fairly extensive. But, but again, I think I think the the level of research and the expanse well, of research, research is much greater today than it was it was back then. I have a I have a little bit of a question on that because because Noam Chomsky and one of his recent lectures. Uh, he talks about how MIT was even even today is pretty much funded by intelligence, military, Department of Defense, and he just kind of spells it out pretty plainly that mm-hmm. uh, that the U.S. government is the throughout the U.S. government every every military and intelligence agency is like the biggest purchaser of new technologies, science, funders of research, and he says that mm-hmm. the entire mm-hmm. the entire academic foundation is based on pretty much military research to start out with. I mean, even down to the the transistors were, were, were more or less kind of not particularly invented, but only sold to and purchased by the U.S. government. You know, so all of this this technological science goes through these big universities. Mm-hmm. So no, I think he's me, correct about that. Uh, he, he gives, you know, uh, he gives some interesting kind of anecdotes about how it happens and how they pass it in and how they seduce the government into doing this or the government seduces them. It's kind of like this this back and forth relationship with academia. Mm-hmm. But to me this is not so fundamentally shocking because of course the government is going to do this and the Department of Defense is going to do this and all this different stuff. So my question is um what is the quali- cuz the way that Chomsky kind of presents it it's a little bit like they'll just pay for almost anything in the hopes that maybe it might be have some Continuous application in a military or intelligence capacity. So, how many of these projects, these so-called brainwashing projects, have met with any kind of really, um, what would be the word for, scary success? You're you're asking in in reference to the past, in, in terms of the 1950s and 60s, or well, yeah, or, I mean, or present you know, day. Well, I mean, I don't I, know I, if you, yeah. we know about too many present day ones, but. Um, Either well, or, we, you know? we know we know about some of the present day ones. I don't think I think Chomsky's wrong uh, if he's saying I'm not I'm not entirely speci- I'm, I'm not entirely knowledgeable about uh, about what you're referring to. I don't think the government willy nilly just throws money out there, mm-hmm. uh, hoping that you know some some dollars will stick and, and produce good results. I think. I think uh, there's some strong ob- objectives at play in terms of of whatever they're funding. Do they fund mm-hmm. some silly stuff or some some things that that don't produce results? Yeah, sure. I mean, government. You know, I think government everywhere. I don't think the U.S. government is any different from any other government. They're they're an apt in a lot of ways, and mm-hmm. and they play favorites, and and monies yeah. go to to friends and friends of friends but I think overall right. I think overall uh they generally know what they're doing I think I studied in terms of the MK Ultra program I think they knew exactly what they were doing I think the objectives were were spelled out 
uh, in fine detail and in very understandable detail. They basically, you know, the in, in a nutshell, what they were trying to do is is come up with means to to control people, uh, to modify right. behavior, and right, right. and so, uh, so when con- I say like control the human mind. When, when I'm saying willy-nilly, I don't mean purely junk science. I mean I mean academic mm-hmm. research. But ones mm-hmm. in which the, the goals are kind of tenuously connected to military things. That's what I meant by that. But that's, that's kind of neither here nor there. The most mm-hmm. important thing is, okay, so they have experiments or some kind of research to control somebody's mind, mm-hmm. right? Um, mm-hmm. And I would m- – my first question, of course, is, is like, okay, well, that's very interesting, but how successful were they, Right. Well, if if you again looking at the fifties and sixties in terms of let's take the specific of LSD, they said they spent a tremendous amount of money on LSD research, and and initially it was considered LSD was considered a wonder drug, and and people within the CIA like Richard Helms were referring to it as as dynamite. It was going to change the nature of. Uh, control of the human mind and right down to uh, interrogation techniques. I I think they found after about 20, they they concluded after about 20 years that LSD in terms of uh, being used for interrogation was was essentially useless. Mm -hmm. Uh, And in terms of... yeah, and in terms of controlling the human mind, it was it was also totally ineffective. Uh, uh, again, useless. I interviewed Sidney Gottlieb, who over who oversaw the program, and and he was very blunt about that. He said he didn't say they wasted a lot of money, but he he implied that a lot of money was spent, and in terms of behavior modification. LSD just didn't measure up to to the initial expectations. But uh, when you when you delve a little bit deeper into what was going on with LSD, and LSD seems to be, a, you know, it's a huge focus. If you go onto the internet, almost everything mm-hmm. turns on LSD research. Mm-hmm. But there was a there was a point in time, and I didn't go into a lot of detail on this in the Olson book because it was really basically off subject in in terms of specifics with with Olson's murder but there was a point in time where where the agency did realize that LSD wasn't effective and but at the same time a number of the research uh, institutes and universities and and some of the du- drug companies including Sandoz mm-hmm. uh close by to where you're all at uh were also were also producing uh, uh, additional drugs mm-hmm. that uh, that were modified forms of LSD and and were refined forms of LSD and mm-hmm. and uh, and there's a whole alphabet soup of 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 those names L A E L A E forty L A E fifty seven so, it just goes on and on and on and so the research didn't stop. Mm-hmm. So basically, of, they were having it, they were having too much fun with it to let it go. No, I mean, I think I think it's well. I think they were having fun with it, but I but to answer your question, I th- I think they were seeing results also, mm-hmm. and yeah. and yeah. and again, in in terms of LSD specifically, no, it you know it didn't work. It was too unpredictable. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and by the mid '60s, most most college students could could have told them. In yeah. an authoritative, authoritative way, uh, uh, that 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 was the case. But but the science, at the same time, the science was evolving. Mm-hmm. And when they okay. found that that LSD twenty five wasn't, you know, wasn't what they wasn't what they wanted. That didn't mean okay, let's let's stop with all ergot based drugs. Uh, right. But the re- the research morphed and, and went into other directions, and and I can guarantee you, there's drugs out there now that 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 are used in mind control fashions that we know nothing about. Yeah, and that probably uh, work probably work in terms of the original and, and probably goal. are extremely effective. Extremely. Because effective. I think it I think it has to be to be pointed out that LSD, uh, well, it was back in the early fifties. 
mm-hmm. late forties, late forties when Sandoz and then Eli Lilly took the took, took it and uh, and started producing it for the for the CIA. Um, that yeah, Eli Eli Lilly took over in 1954. Yeah, uh, and that was just a starting point. Basically, they took right. LSD and they started looking at it, and that piqued their interest. But there's mm-hmm. a vast number of other psychotropic drugs that not only are, are natural, but that they also probably synthesized from mm-hmm. the natural drugs. And they've been doing this kind of research for decades now. So who knows what they come up that's, with? They had an original. That's a, that's exactly right. And in, in Sandoz, Sandoz Pharmaceutical Company included, they realized also in from about 1950 until about late 1953 or early 1954. Sandoz was basically giving away their LSD uh, mm-hmm. in ho- giving away to researchers worldwide, not not just to the not just to the CIA, but to to scientists in France, England, um, uh, Norway. I mean, virtually every country you can think of, in hopes that those researchers would come up with with an effective means of using the drug. Sandoz had no idea what they had. Uh, and and had no idea how it could be used, but they eventually came to the conclusion that well there there is no effective use for LSD. Now a lot of a lot of scientists out there today disagree with that. They they claim there was some success with LSD in terms of treating drug addicts, in terms of treating alcoholics, but but that uh, a lot of people have reservations about that research but again mm. sandos like like lilly and a lot of a lot of the other pharmaceutical companies out there uh in in terms of moving away from lsd didn't abandon all research with psychedelics or or psychotropic chemicals but 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 moved on to research that that involved refined products Mm-hmm. Uh, based based on the feedback they were getting from from CIA researchers uh, and and mm-hmm. researchers in in other countries, mm-hmm. and psycho psychotropic drugs were only one of the tools used in brainwashing uh, protocols. That's right. There That's was right. also it was... electroshocks. There was those mm-hmm. repeated suggestion one thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand times, and those. Induced comas, just uh, mm-hmm. um, insulin, insulin uh, induced comas. Insulin, and, uh, insulin shock, morphine, yeah. heroin. I mean, initially, again, in the early 50s, they used everything. You can some of the some of the artichoke project uh, uh, documents uh, that I was able to obtain just have you know two or three pages of, of various means that they wanted to they wanted to experiment with practice on on various subjects overseas and they did that uh and in some cases there there are a few cases where where they reported effective results not with LSD but primarily with narco hypnosis uh unfortunately they didn't explain what what drugs they were using in combi- in combination with hypnosis but but there were there were some uh there were some uh, very uh Fine results in in their ex- estimation. I think the agency bent over backwards in the late 60s and 70s to to downplay the effectiveness of hypnosis. Yeah. But I think if you really read some of the documents that came out um, in the late 60s and a few from the 70s, you'll find that uh, hypnosis. Uh, really produced some fine results, and that the agency uh, pumped a lot of money uh, into additional research with hypnosis and narco hypnosis. Uh, I have a question here. It's uh, in the 60s. It's pretty clear that the CIA and friends were able to break the will of individuals and to program mm-hmm. them to do whatever they wanted them to do, well, and to mm-hmm. introduce. Or hypnotic suggestion, so they would not forget, or they would forget some. Uh, they would remember something else. The, the, mm-hmm. the question just before that: mm-hmm. fine results, fine, good results, excellent results. What objectives were they were they trying to get these results on? What what, what was the purpose or purposes? 
Well, there were a number of purposes, and and I don't claim to know all of them, but but in in going through hundreds of documents, uh, a number of the purposes uh, emerged. In in the one of the primary ones was related to assassination, and and what they wanted to do was uh, either through drugs initially, or or as it evolved through narco hypnosis, program people. Uh, to commit assassination, uh, and then basically erase their memories. Uh, and erase was was actually a term that they used, uh, so that there would be no, so that the subject committing the assassination uh, after the fact wouldn't remember. That that I don't think was very effective at all. Uh, mm. And I think. I think what they realized, and this is where common sense comes into play, is that it really wasn't it really wasn't necessary to produce programmed assassins um, to commit assassinations uh, when there was a plenty plentiful supply of people out there, both domestically and and uh, and in foreign countries, that would gladly perform assassinations mm-hmm. for money. Yeah. Uh, so people and that, would, and that say, would dis and that would disappear afterwards and and I think in the sixties you see the if you look at non m k ultra documentation you see that the the agency was actually creating large stables of assassins uh in, in a number of key locations both in america and 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 in other countries in europe and and they were very successful at that so there wasn't there wasn't that em- emphasis on creating assassins, but the other thing they wanted to do uh, fell into more practical uh, categories. They 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 use the the agency uses a lot of couriers uh, and people that that carry you know diplomatic pouches and messages all over the world. And what and what they wanted to do was was to better control those people so that. Uh, they could erase their memories and and then in terms of their own agents or or operatives what they wanted to do uh was to 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 go into the mind of those people and and basically erase certain memories there was one report i saw that was absolutely fascinating uh that reported on one one agency official who had gone into the hospital to have some sort of minor surgery and 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 but it 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 called for him to be put to sleep uh, uh before the surgery was performed and and not long after being put to sleep he started he started talking i guess so to speak talking in his sleep and said a number of indiscreet things and that caused a lot of alarm in the agency and they said you know we need to we need to intensify efforts to to better erase certain memories were they successful mm-hmm. at that i i honestly don't know uh i would i would doubt it uh but yeah. but again that was one of the objectives in the can, 50s can, uh yeah for basically for drug mules and people involved mm-hmm. in sensitive uh yeah yeah not exactly all american activities yeah, in, I mean, looking looking backwards now, looking retrospectively, a lot of this, a lot of what was going on, really isn't all that sophisticated by today's standards. In in the fifties and sixties, it would be considered fairly sophisticated, but again, today, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's not. And and there are known drugs now on the market that that achieve some of those objectives. Uh, Specifically by design, or, or specifically by by uh, by byproduct. Uh, yeah, and and perhaps they use some of those known drugs. But uh, I was I was thinking that maybe maybe not so much back in the fifties and sixties, but um, today there does seem to be a, a possible uh, benefit to having a mind programmed assassin. In the sense that where it kind of dovetails or or furthers kind of geopolitical agendas, mm. for example, mm-hmm. today uh, you if you want to kill someone and you want to make it public, 
it's not just that you want to kill the person or have the person assassinated, but you want to inflame public opinion against mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the assassin. Uh, mm -hmm. And his nationality or his religion, for example. So if you you know right. if you want to promote the war on terror today, you can't have a a true blue uh, Caucasian American killing somebody when uh, an Arab would be much more uh, supportive of the uh, of the of the American uh, kind of geopolitical agenda to uh, fight a war on terror, Muslim terrorism. Mm -hmm. You know. No, I think I think that's exactly correct, and and I think in terms of assassination. I think the mistake a lot of people make, just speaking about, uh, in terms of their thinking, speaking about assassination in general, they tend to think about high-profile figures. They tr they tend to think about, you know, Fidel Castro or 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 the leader, you know, the leader of another country. But mm -hmm. but I think assassination in terms of the intelligence community, and not just with the American intelligence community, but with with all all intelligence communities, I think assassination happens a lot more often than people think uh, mm -hmm. to to low level people, to people you'd have no idea uh, are even viable targets. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you know if you scan the literature in terms of the speculative literature about people that possibly have been assassinated, you'll find you know hundreds of names. Mm -hmm. uh, of people worldwide, uh, a good, you know, a good example in this country would be, I don't know, about ten years ago, ten or fifteen years ago, I think there was there was a an astonishing number of microbiologists uh, mm -hmm. that died that died during a, I think it was a three or four year period. Now that could have been entirely coincidental, but. But when you looked at, I think there were 12 or 12 or 15 people, but when you looked at some of those specific cases, they were extremely odd. Uh, <laughs> some were suicides. There was one biochemist that jumped off a bridge, uh, that stopped midway across a bridge in the United States and then jumped to his death. And, and there was, you know, just no apparent reason for this person to kill himself. But... Mm -hmm. And I'm only using that as an example of of how people could be programmed uh, in terms of narco hypnosis or or other mm -hmm. psychochemicals uh, to to either commit suicide or or for somebody to to actually you know commit an assassination mm -hmm. on that individual and make it look like uh, you know a suicide or an accidental death. But I think again that happens a lot more often. Uh, yeah. than than we know than people think yeah and then than they realize um there's one just in terms of what I was saying a second ago there's one example uh, just one of many I think uh, uh, that relates to the ubiquitous uh, Muslim terror plots that have gone on over mm. the past ten or twelve years um for example there's a guy um Zacharias Musawi. Yeah. Who, um, he was allegedly the 20th uh, hijacker, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. I mean there was no real evidence for it, but he was uh, detained. Um, he was he was detained uh, on the basis that he was involved in the 9/11 attacks, mm -hmm. and uh, he he was in 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 jail for a long time, and who knows how, who knows who or had access to him, but uh, he claimed that the uh, you know, when he appeared in court, his mother didn't recognize him. He didn't recognize his mother. His mother came from France. Right. She said, that's not my son. Uh, he himself claimed that the FBI bugged his fan in an effort mm -hmm. to frame him. He's quoted mm -hmm. as saying, where is my fan? It must be forensically examined before they kill me. And he right. also said, I, I have a master's in international bombing business from the University Bombing Limited. My mentor is the chief executor <laughs> of the World Terror Company. You know, I mean, that's, you know, he can be put down as a kind of crazy person, but his mother testifies right. that he was a normal guy living a normal life before that, you know? Right, but that's and not that's really evidence for the effectiveness of it. That's just, I mean, you know, it's well, no, but easy no, to make a person the, crazy. The effectiveness is here. They can say to the public, look, he's a crazy person, and then he's condemned in the public court of opinion, and bang, there we've got another war on terror suspect right. locked up, mm -hmm. job well done, everyone goes home. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's not that he himself is actually operationally effective. He's useless. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He's useless. Well, I, mean, I think it would have been he, a more convincing... He's locked up now, right? He, he's yep. locked up for life, right? Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah, another good example, and actually I think it was before him was the was the young the young man from Chicago, Jose Padillo. Padilla, Padilla yeah, yeah. Uh, who 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 also is in prison now for life. Mm-hmm. Uh, who was gil- given LSD before he mm-hmm. appeared in court? According to his, his attorneys, he was dosed yeah. with LSD on four or five occasions, and mm-hmm. when he appeared in court, his family didn't recognize him, and he he was basically in a zombie state. Mm-hmm. I think exactly. I think I think that's a good example of of how LSD is used by the intelligence community now. That that it's a you know it's wow. an extremely effective drug in terms of when you dose someone with LSD and they're unwitting of it, uh, it can be an extremely frightening experience mm-hmm. if you're given the proper dosage. If you, you know, if you're given 150, 200 mics of, of LSD, that's going to be a, a hell of an intense trip. And mm-hmm. and and it doesn't necessarily have to be LSD. It can be there's again. Here's a good example. I should have thought of it before. What LSD. When the when the agency was working with LSD, and this was both the agency hand in hand with the military, uh, some of that research morphed into uh, a stronger c- compound that's that's nicknamed BZ. I mm-hmm. can't think of the chemical name for it. And uh, but that was that was a drug that was. It's commonly commonly described as being nine to ten times stronger than LSD mm-hmm. uh, in terms of intensity and and length of of, of effective period. Uh, the some doses of LSD given to uh, enlisted men there were there were expansive experiments in this country lasted anywhere from four to six days. That's a long time. To be under the influence of a of a hallucinogenic and I'm not no and, yeah, yeah and God only you. yeah if you if you're unwitting of that you're certainly <clears throat> going to come out of that experience uh, thinking that you know you, you basically suffered a psychotic ep- episode yeah. if, mm-hmm. if not worse and you might uh, not come back and then it. if you're given that drug three or four times um, you know I don't I don't, I don't brain, know right? what the result would be. Yeah, there mm-hmm. were extensive there were extensive experiments that were conducted at Edgewood Arsenal, and this is this was by the U.S. Army. Of course, the CIA monitored these experiments fairly closely. But uh, in the late fifties through to about I think 1966, uh, and those experiments involved around 6,000 U.S. servicemen. Uh, so they basically had a conveyor belt going. Uh, with human subjects uh, that they were dosing with both LSD and, and BZ. Uh, and in the 70s, when, when the U.S. Congress found out about that, there was a lot of outrage, a lot of feigned outrage, I'm sure. They, some mm-hmm. of those members probably knew about it as it was taking place. And and the, and the Pentagon, the U.S. military, was ordered to conduct a follow-up t- test on, on the subjects, on the five or 6,000 people. I think it was 5,700 people that were, were subject to these tests. And the military started those, te- uh, started those follow-up studies fairly intensively and actually did a mailing to, to everyone who was given either LSD or BZ or both uh, and other drugs, uh, requesting that you know they sub- subject themselves to interviews, and and that study went on for about five or six months. But the results that were coming in were so dismal in terms of uh, in terms of the 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 effects, the long term effects that a lot of these enlisted people were were experiencing, including a lot of suicides and. And mm-hmm. people that were had been institutionalized that the study just basically dissipated uh and there was there was no final report i've got a I've got a few copies of the the initial preliminary reports, and they're just they're really frightening to read mm-hmm. uh you know to read these interviews with wives of former officers who had been Part, uh, you know, part and parcel of these experiments. Who had, you know, the one wife talking about her husband going out on the front lawn 
one evening and just and shooting blowing his brains out in front of her and the children and mm-hmm. and uh and they had no idea why until this letter came from the Pentagon explaining that he had been the subject to the subject of a, a drug experiment. Mm. Uh, it's her- it's horrific. Uh, I mean, you're, you're. I mean, to think that that was going on, to realize that that was going on, and that's one of the things that really comes through in the kind of uh, research that you provide in your books. Uh, is this kind of uh, in the 40s and 50, 50s and 60s when this research kind of took off? That the culture of just acceptance of um, of, of this kind of brutality against uh, against human beings. And I just want to quote a couple of things. There's um, there's a passage here on, um, it refers to uh, Dr. Robert Heath, who was in the right. Department of Psychiatry right. and Neuro- Neurology at the Tulane University School of Medicine in New Orleans, Louisiana. Mm-hmm. And he mm-hmm. uh, said basically that, um, or sorry, one of his associates on the experiments that was conducting these experiments on, on human beings, um, uh, on, on you know mind manipulation, including the implantation of electrodes and uh, drug uh, drug experimentation said that it was cheaper to use niggers than cats mm-hmm. because they were mm-hmm. everywhere and cheap experimental animals. Yeah, that was a pretty outrageous and, statement. It's... And there's another, but there's another one from uh, you say that you um, a Fort uh, Detrick researcher in a 2001 interview uh, stated that. Um, under our Special Operations Division agreements with the Pentagon and the CIA, we were forbidden to record in writing or to produce written reports on any of the results of our cancer experiments. But I can mm-hmm. assure you that people died as a result of these experiments. Mm-hmm. Death was an intended byproduct of experiments. Death, mm-hmm. Deaths marked success and desired mm-hmm. results, be they among humans used or the hordes of other animals targeted. He said it was, uh, and another one, another researcher said it was beyond any measure of inhumanity or disregard for human dignity. So, I mean, my question is, who are these people and how did they ever justify uh, the ones as scientists who, who, who apparently were going home and to families? How did they ever justify to themselves? What kind of culture per, per, uh, was, was, was persisted at that time where these people could justify this to themselves? Or to well, it's a it's a good question. It's a sixty four thousand dollar question, and and the explanation that that a lot of these people give you, the, a lot of the people that were involved in these experiments at the time, was that it was the height of the the Cold War, and that other people, meaning I guess military people and agency people, were dying overseas, and and that it was a life or death situation. I think that's a horrible, that's a horrible explanation and excuse for what was going on uh well, it well, certainly doesn't come doesn't come close to to excusing uh some of the experiments that were conducted i don't think we i don't think we have any idea uh i i i mean i researched the olson book for about 10 years almost 11 years uh mm-hmm. and then took two years to write it and 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 I honestly think as big and as, as expansive as that book is, it only touches the tip of the iceberg in terms of the experiments that were conducted. I, I spoke to a lot of people that, a lot of former scientists uh, who implied <coughs> that, that the tests that were be, being conducted uh, domestically at Edgewood and in a number of the CIA, CIA safe houses in New York and San Francisco were were nothing compared to what was going on overseas. Uh, a number mm-hmm. of scientists told me that that basically uh, that a lot was done in Haiti. Uh, they did, they wouldn't go into any detail other than to say it was basically it was essentially the the devil's playground in terms of drug testing, uh, and that included the military uh, testing a lot of drugs for pharmaceutical companies. Uh, that they didn't that they didn't dare do in this country, or that the FDA, the the Food and Drug Administration, uh, refused to allow them to to experiment within this country. So, I think there's glimpses and, and glimmers of of even more horrific activities that went on in in other countries. But but 
you know, for obvious I mean, reasons, a lot of these people won't go on record uh, in terms no. of what was actually I mean, happening. You know, the horror of the Nazis and what the Nazis did in concentration camps is always held up, uh, you know, as a... Uh, as the epitome of evil, you know, Dr. Joseph Mengele and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. I mean, th- there's no difference. Uh, well, they brought but, all those scientists over here. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, yeah. Well, they did, there. and, and Olson, Olson actually worked with a few of those people. Uh, and a lot initially, a lot of the a lot of the the drug experimentation that happened in the in the mid 40s and in late 1940s. Uh, was based on captured documents from from uh, the Nazi death camps. Uh, the Nazis did some experimentation with drugs, primarily mescaline. Uh, mm. There there are some rumbles to the effect that maybe maybe they had access to early crude forms of LSD through Sandoz, but but that's never been confirmed. Uh, but but a lot of those captured documents, which have never seen the light of day, are referred to uh, in a lot of the the early U.S. Army and, and CIA documentation uh, in terms of being the impetus behind some of their experiments. Yeah, um, it's just the, the, go ahead about the um, the kind of meta apology for all this that this was the Cold War and. Mm-hmm. The paranoia that our enemies over there might or are doing this to us, therefore we need to be super prepared and know everything there is about this in order to counter it. There's some discussion in your book, um, maybe you can clarify your position on, on it for us now. Um, it, it's not clear to me that there really was, especially in terms of the Korean case, that mm-hmm. this was being done to our boys, therefore we set up these programs in order to try and sort of back engineer whatever it is they're doing to brainwash people. That's Mm -hmm. why we have to do it. It seems that Mm -hmm. that's a kind of black hole in itself that this was completely projected onto the Chinese, the Koreans, the Russians. There doesn't seem to be much, if any, evidence that they were doing this first. Therefore, we responded or reacted and started doing it ourselves. What do you think of that? Well, I, I think in terms of the Russians, I think I think the Russians reacted to what we were doing. I don't think the uh-huh. Russians were doing anything with psychochemicals in, until they got wind of the fact that that the Americans were experimenting with psychochemicals. And and you know, of course, it's it's hard to get detailed information out out of the former Soviet Union. But the, I mean, there were there. There, there were some drug experiments conducted by the Russians, but but nothing compared to what was going on here. In terms of Korea, uh, I honestly I think Korea, for the most part, meaning the Korean War, uh, was used as an excuse because the Korean War took place in 1950, 1951, and and most of the most most of the drug experimentation. Or, or the precursors to it were well underway before the in America were well underway before the Korean War broke out. I think it was very convenient for for the U.S. government to use uh, as an example, as an excuse for their drug experimentation, the the 23 or 26 U.S. servicemen that that had been captured in. And and allegedly brainwashed uh, in Korea, in North Korea, uh, as an excuse for for really accelerating experiments here. But I think when you really when you look at uh, declassified documentation concerning those service people, who who all except for maybe two or three, eventually came back to this country, there really there was no. Uh, narco brainwashing that was going on. They were they were brainwashed through fairly intensive interrogation and, and conventional uh, interrogation techniques uh, that that bordered or or crossed the the torture threshold, meaning sleep deprivation and and mm-hmm. uh, and, and other techniques. But but nothing that nothing that came close to what what 
the U.S. government eventually did from the from 1953 forward. I think it was just, again, it was a very convenient excuse uh, to justify what was going on. I think a lot of you know, money comes into play here too, and and the research and the scientific community in the United States uh, really bears a lot of the guilt as to what was going on because as 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 one of you mentioned earlier the there there were a lot of uh, chomsky said in terms of today and and it applies to the 50s and 60s there there were a lot of contracts that were going out and and it involved a fair amount of money and a lot of people a lot of scientists in the research communities at private uh, private research institutions or colleges and universities really wanted a piece of that pie, uh, and so there was. If you look at a list of of the experimentation that was going on, uh, a lot of it was duplicative of of you know what what was going on at ABC University was also going on at XYZ University, and and the reason for that was people simply wanted a piece of the monetary pie. Uh, in the psychiatric and psychology community uh, really, you know, did uh, various players in those communities really wanted to jump onto the the money train in terms of, of well, what was going on. It seems to me, and it's a bit horrible, but, but kind of from a, a slightly cold and scientific kind of perspective, um, what about the situation is all the more horrible is that these, these people had crazy ideas i mean and they, and they should have kind of for the most part known better than to even bother because they they were kind of a little bit out of there out there you know we're going to mm-hmm. completely control somebody's mind and install a personality in them and turn them into a super assassin mm-hmm. and, and that's that's a little bit of a ridiculous proposition it's kind of quite a large leap from from what we understand about the human mind mm-hmm. that, that it's so easy to just simply wipe it and put something else in it's a little bit ridiculous agree. But if they had a tree achieved true and complete success to the point where they had mastered entirely the mind, mm-hmm. I think in a certain sense from a scientific perspective, at least there'd be that. But the fact that they tried something ridiculous that tortured and abused people, and they should have known that it was ridiculous, and it turned out to be ridiculous, and they didn't meet with much success, makes it all the more horrible. It makes it almost purely sadistic, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 it's all the more horrible because they failed and they should have known better and the fact that they didn't just makes them look evil and incompetent and it's just it's, it's well, disgusting. Th- to be there, honest. there are some cases that um, Al Browley describes in the Olson book where it seems pretty clear that the objective of the administrators of these drugs and programs, their purpose was to drive people as insane and psychotic as possible. I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm thinking specifically of the farm, this in, in prison or detention center in, in Kentucky, mm-hmm. and some, mm-hmm. some of the people who survived that and their descriptions mm-hmm. of it, where the doctors seem yeah, to go th- and think encourage that, complete right, that, destruction. That was one of the more, more horrific uh, examples. Uh, you had... That that was actually the the I'm trying to think. It was a federal facility. It was actually uh, a lot of people refer to it as a as a prison, but it really wasn't a prison. What it was was an addiction facility, uh, a, a, and a, a place where addicts, primarily morphine and heroin addicts, went to be cured. Uh, but what happened? I mean that the the CIA viewed that as an ideal facility to conduct experiments uh out of the sunlight where where nobody would notice uh and and people wouldn't have the credibility to complain but but what eventually which quickly happened after they contracted with that facility was that they found that after the 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 first few experiments that were conducted with LSD was that the addicts there didn't like the drug? Uh, they didn't mm. like it at all, and were refusing were refusing to participate in the experiments. So what they did, and this is <laughs> this is more horrifying in some ways than the experiments with uh, themselves. 
they said, okay, well, we'll give you heroin or morphine uh, in return for your participation in these experiments. These mm-hmm. are these are these are men that were there uh, to be cured of their drug addiction. But but what 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 eventually happened is that they were they were contributing towards their addiction in, in terms in regards to using them as guinea pigs mm-hmm. for other drugs. And unfortunately, we don't have some of those people. I, I I think I interviewed one of those one of those participants. But but uh, there were many many participants there, and God only knows uh, you know where or what mm-hmm. happened to those people. But and and the other really horrendous terrible uh, ex- experiment that i mean there were many but one of the worst was in montreal with with ewan cameron uh in terms of what he was doing with with patients mm-hmm. at, at 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 his uh at his facility connected with mcgill university and that and that didn't start until that didn't commence until i think it was 1956 or 57 Mm-hmm. Uh, and and his experiments in which were supposed to contribute towards better interrogation techniques uh, just uh, basically destroyed the minds of a lot of his subjects. Uh, it was termed psychic driving, but but mm-hmm. basically what it was was psychological torture. Yeah, I mean the. the... The impression you get is that they, the CIA was just looking around for anybody uh, in a vulnerable position that they could exploit. I mean, there was there's a reference I think in your book somewhere out to um, uh, the, the CIA looking at the, coming up with a figure of about four thousand uh, uh, military personnel who had been court-martialed and who were mm-hmm. either awaiting trial or were in prison for some offences. Mm-hmm. And that they said, well, mm-hmm. these are perfect, uh, perfect people for us to use for these experiments because we can uh, blackmail them. Well, offer, well, offer them time off, or offer, mm-hmm. offer, offer to put a good word in with the judge or whatever in exchange for them participating mm-hmm. in and, experiments. And that was, in that, yeah, and that was early on. I think that there's a there's a artichoke document, and that's that's a program that was separate from MK Ultra. Mm-hmm. It was an operational program, which which made it even worse in terms of the experimentation they conducted. But uh, they saw federal prisons uh, and military brigs as as basically happy hunting grounds for experiments, uh, and that was signed off on. Yet, you know, we don't we don't have the documentation as to what's what facilities were actually used. We know that they went into the Atlanta federal prison. And conducted uh, extensive experiments there. One of the problems, and you know, it's mentioned a few times in the book, is that in 1973, when when word was leaking out slowly to the public and the media in this country about uh, about the MK Ultra program and other programs, uh, the CIA ordered that. All the all the documentation uh, concerning the programs be destroyed, and and yeah. they were actually all uh, they they were all gathered up, put in a truck, and carted away to an incinerator in West Virginia. Uh, yeah. But what they overlooked uh, that John John Marks was able to resurrect and and include in his book, The Search for the Manchurian Candidate. Uh, what they overlooked were, were a lot of uh, financial documents that that were filed separately uh, mm-hmm. that gave us sort of the the skeleton or the the outlines uh, of a lot of the sub projects under MK Ultra. But again, that that was just the tip of the iceberg. There was you know there was Project Bluebird, there was Project Artichoke that that went well beyond the the reaches of MK Ultra. There was MK Naomi. Uh, there was some radiological experimentation that took place uh, that we only have glimpses of uh, that involved, you know, a lot of human subjects. Uh, and and those that documentation may still be out there somewhere. Some of it, some of it is beginning to dribble through, and it's and it's hard fought to to get it from the CIA. I 
I still, uh, you know, I've stayed on that and and still periodically file freedom of information requests in this country for documentation, and it's it's constantly uh, a, a struggle to to get. Uh, various documents related to that. It can take upwards of anywhere from four to six uh, to eight months to even get an answer, and then you know maybe another five or six months to get specific documents, or they're de- denied, and you have to appeal, and mm-hmm. and uh, you know another another year may go by before you get anything. But there's a lot still out there in terms of uh, in terms of documentation. Uh, concerning horrific experiments that went on, uh, and I think eventually, eventually, all that will come out. The one thing I, I have discovered in terms of filing freedom of information requests over the last couple of years, the last two or three years since the Olson book uh, was completed, is that uh, the the levels of government uh, that that were involved in a lot of the MK Ultra tests uh, were, were much more expansive uh, than than anybody thought, and and uh, there was you know there, there was uh, in terms of the National Institutes of Health there were a lot of very high level scientists that were involved in in a lot of the uh, drug experimentation uh, that went on that have managed to. Uh, to date escape scrutiny but but that's starting to come out so i guess what i'm trying to say is is that the 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 level of experimentation was was much more far reaching and and involved higher levels of the us government and various us agencies than than anybody imagined yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, obviously that's the tip of the iceberg that we can reach and only that, because if the information is critical, it will be redacted. If it's, if mm-hmm. it's very critical, it, will, it won't be uh, published, released, mm-hmm. declassified. And if mm-hmm. it's very, very critical, it won't be even filed. So mm-hmm. you have to, to go through uh, to get documents and infer, deduce from uh, the few available data. And I have a question about this. Uh, Developments, of about course, who? the official uh, about those developments, uh, development of those technologies. Uh, mm-hmm. Of course, the official position of the CIA that uh, in the 70s they stopped those experiments, and uh, mm-hmm. apparently it's not the case. I was wondering if it's in in the 60s they managed to create Manchurian candidates, uh, mm-hmm. assassins. Uh, in between, mm-hmm. you had billions of dollars invested. You had thousands of people involved. You had the discovery of genomics, nanotechnology, radiology, and other kind of radiations. Um, mm-hmm. um, today, they are virtually to control. To they are virtually able to control anyone, anywhere, in any field. No, is it a paranoid idea? No, I, I don't think it's a paranoid idea at all. And I think I think there's you know a number of possible examples out there even you know spe- specific to my book a secret order i didn't draw any conclusions uh about lee harvey oswald but but what i did come up with was a a fair amount of what i considered to be very circumstantial evidence that he was possibly uh an experiment an experimental subject when when he was a youth and afterwards and mm-hmm. and i think yeah. you know is there anything that says yes he was no there isn't there mm-hmm. isn't there's a fair amount of circumstantial evidence i think that maybe the more riper example would be sirhan sirhan uh who assassinated uh robert kennedy rfk and i think there's there's a fair amount of very strong circumstantial evidence that perhaps uh he was a narco hypnosis uh mm-hmm. yeah. subject and 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 uh and and was led towards that and, and you know was led towards that assass- assassination by by forces 
uh, human forces unknown. Was it the CIA? Possibly. Was it the U.S. Army? Who who knows? But I think there's a lot of uh, large, looming, un, unanswered questions about that assassination that yeah. that in a lot of ways that are are even more provocative mm-hmm. uh, than the Kennedy assassination. In terms of yeah. Oswald, I, I honestly don't think that that Lee Harvey Oswald was any kind of uh, Manchurian candidate. I think I th- that's not to say he wasn't manipulated and and used as a patsy in in terms of in terms of the Kennedy assassination. But was he a Manchurian candidate? I I just don't see the evidence. I think it's possible. I think it's. I'd even well, I mean, use the word strongly possible, but well, but again, I don't think um, I don't think the evidence is there. A Manchurian candidate is, by definition, someone who uh, is a, is a is a brainwashed assassin. And right, a mind, a mind is, control assassin. Yeah, and I think <laughs> the evidence is pretty conclusive that Oswald did not kill Kennedy. Uh, you know that that the, in terms of the shots, the whole uh, analysis mm-hmm. of where the shots came from. So by that definition, he's not. But as you say, uh, he was basically seems to have been sheep dipped around the country to set him up, like you said, as a patsy he to was take wolf-dipped. the fall. <laughs> he was wolf dipped. Yeah, yeah, I think I think he was I think he was strongly manipulated. And and again, yeah. I guess what I'm saying is I don't think that manipulation necessarily had to involve. Uh, drugs, narco hypnosis, or, or or anything to that effect. I think I think he was, you know, I think he was an individual that was easily manipulated. Some mm-hmm. people would strongly disagree with that and and say that he was extremely intelligent and was actually an operative and and uh, mm-hmm. and was part and parcel of of the assassination, but not actually the assassin. I'm not so sure of that. I I no. think yeah. I think I think I think there's too much there, there, there's too much unexplained evidence in terms of of Oswald that that nobody uh, has has rationally explained away the fact mm-hmm. that in the fact that Oswald actually got a job in the the school book depository and. And was there, you know, was was there for the event, and and possibly had a rifle. I think that, you know, I, I think a lot of people argue with that. But but the fact that the that those facts exist haven't been completely discounted, and and that's where we get into the whole snake pit of of, of the Kennedy assassination and and trying to. And trying to 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 explain away various facts uh, concerning Oswald, uh, you know why why did he get a job at the the Texas mm-hmm. School Book Depository? You know what was he doing there? Uh, it seems to be entirely coincidental. I don't go into that in my book at all. Mm-hmm. I probably will mm-hmm. on volume two, but it seems to be entirely coincidental that that he that he obtained that job there and he was only there for what two or three weeks uh <laughs> be, before Kennedy came to Dallas but how did that actually happen mm. uh and and then yeah. there's the whole black hole of what Oswald was doing in New Orleans and and mm. you have to open the door on the garrison investigation and David Ferry yeah. and Clay Shaw and that that to me just in a lot of ways clouds the whole issue. Mm-hmm. I, I find it hard I find it hard to accept that Clay Shaw and David Ferry uh were were major players in the Kennedy mm-hmm. assassination. I just don't I don't see them as, as two men that had the wherewithal uh mm-hmm. to really carry any carry anything like that forward. That doesn't mean mm-hmm. that doesn't mean they weren't bit players. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. In the entire thing, I think there were there was a tremendous cast of bit players, and when you look at, I've never done this. Somebody should do it. When you, when you add up all the people, all the names of various people in the intelligence or military community that were in Dallas on the day of the assassination, mm-hmm. you have a long, long list of names, mm-hmm. including the number of. 
Yeah, uh, you know, and and a number of French, you know, French alleged French assassins who just mm-hmm. happened to be there. You have a long, long list of names, and no, and I think that. does is that coincidental or or does that mean that somebody was basically loading up, you know, yeah, the city I think, to I think that's more just more cause a tremendous yeah. amount of confusion. Hurting the waters. Yeah, just to put as many people in there as possible so that anybody who does investigate it exactly. is going to come up with them. more yeah. names than they could possibly deal with. You know? There's something exactly. that, I found, that I found striking in the secret order as well is the, this repeating pattern. Often you have a, a character, an individual, who wants to be a whistleblower or who wants to give an information, looking for a journalist or looking for a doctor, or looking for a politician. And often you have a a similar sentence. So he went to X, or he went to Y, he went to Z, but he didn't know this X, Y, or Z was a CIA asset. And when mm-hmm. reading this book, you realize how the CIA network was pervasive in the U.S. society in those key uh, sectors. Is is mm-hmm. is most certainly is still pervasive. I mean, it's you got to remember it's a bureaucracy in a certain sense. It is a government agency, you know. I mean, and they're just. They just go around and build up these quote unquote networks of paid lackeys or favored lackeys and mm-hmm. well, the, 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 mm-hmm. that's a question here. It's a kind of elementary question you 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 sort of trace the outline of it in the in the book on the Olson, and that is what is the c i a I mean on paper, you look at it it's one if you looked at it on a kind of a tree map. Diagram would be one agency among many in the U.S., but mm-hmm. it's the sheer reach that CIA CIA names or CIA contracts reach to across the U.S. government. It's almost like even by the 50s, certainly by the 60s, it had insinuated itself into the entire fabric or most of the fabric of the U.S. government. Mm-hmm. What we're looking we're I, not we're not just talking about an agency here with X number of employees. We're talking about something mm-hmm. that's total in its scope. Yeah, it's a it's a it's beyond it's an it's an octopus in terms of its reach into into the US government alone. I think and I go into that a little bit in the Olson book and, and some in in the book of Secret Order, but its reach is is the dimensions of its reach are basically unbelievable. It it you'll find in in the Olson book uh, in terms of the the my explanation of the the investigation that went into uh, the Rockefeller Commission findings in in the in the mid 1970s. Uh, some of the players that were involved in trying to block that investigation were CIA. Operatives who are actually planted within the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, mm-hmm. and and in some ways that's kind of mind-boggling. Why 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 the CIA would even see fit to have operatives within the IRS? Basically, I mean, and, and, and it begs the answer that the, the the only reason for that is 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 essentially access to information. Mm-hmm. And that again was the 1970s. It's no different today. Uh, the the CIA is probably, in terms of employees alone, twice the size it was uh, in the late 60s and 1970s. I don't. I, much, I think at, la- at last count. At, at last count, and I haven't done. I haven't done a search on the number of employees since. I think maybe 2000, 2001, but worldwide uh, about 300,000 employees, and that all the that means that means just officially employees, yeah, uh, meaning known employees, people that mm-hmm. get a get a a check every two weeks, every month uh, from the Central Intelligence Agency. I think when you put assets. And operatives and contractors and subcontractors on top of that, you're you're talking easily anywhere from six to eight hundred thousand people. That's a phenomenal number of people, uh, 
and and it really it really begs the question: How do you manage that mm-hmm. number of people? And I don't believe that they do. It? No, I don't. I don't believe that they do either. And that's why I think uh, when when people ad- advance the theory that that the Kennedy that both Kennedy assassinations were conducted by rogue elements of the CIA, yeah, absolutely. Does that make sense as a theory? Absolutely. Uh, when, the, when you're looking, when you're looking at an agency with with half a million people, uh, mm-hmm. it only makes well, sense that one one hand doesn't know what the other hand exactly. is doing. Exactly, mm-hmm. because I mean, it's it's a man. I think that it just sort of is like a kind of a cancerous growth inside the U.S. Mm-hmm. government. I mean, intelligence agencies mm-hmm. kind of are. I mean, it just kind of spreads through this sort of collection of patronage and mm-hmm. uh, kickbacks and buy-offs and, you know, things like that, so that it is expanded to the gigantic monstrosity. But I don't really think that there's a a real central nervous system. Maybe there is who kind of has an idea of what a lot is going on, but I think that there's probably a lot of things that they don't even know about, so subunits and sub-task force and subcommittees and all this different stuff going on that really do kind of probably operate a bit with impunity. And that's also why, Mm -hmm. in in a certain sense, I think that the CIA sometimes kind of comes off as a little bit incompetent. Because they don't, because they don't know what, again, they don't know what, you know, one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing. It's, I mean, 9-11 is a good example of that. There were, Mm -hmm. there were, and some of that came out in dribbles with the 9-11 commission, not only in terms of the CIA, but, but also the FBI. There were people in, with the FBI in field offices, and there were people, there were uh, analysts within headquarters at CIA that that had a good idea that 9/11 was going to happen, and had more than an idea that, yeah. that I had knew a, it that knew it was going to happen, and that it was, was only even, a matter of time. But but that information wasn't filtering up or down or sideways or. Or left or right to the to the proper people, if you believe the conventional well, story. Well, on yeah. that on that topic, though, I was watching a French program, uh, and I don't remember who what the guy's name was, but he was a he was a former executive in the CIA, um, mm-hmm. who was on this French show because he spoke French, and mm-hmm. um, he was they, they, they were kind of talking about George Bush and his this interview mm-hmm. that he gave where he was like, oh you know, blah, 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 but we didn't have intelligence or the intelligence was bad and it failed. And uh, here's a, C- a CIA guy, supposedly, you know, sitting there saying, oh, he lied. We said this and we said that and our analysts said this and said that. And the thing that struck me was not whether or not what he says is true, because I never believe a spy ever under any circumstances for any reason. Right. Anything that he says is immediately automatically the inverse, and I still won't believe that anyway, just because he <laughs> right. says, I used to work for the CIA. I'll never believe a single thing you say. Um, mm. But what, what I found interesting was the fact that he was on this show uh, mm-hmm. bad-mouthing, uh, in a certain sense, bad-mouthing the, the government, the U.S. government, uh, the, the president, the former president at the time, and also talking about the CIA and so, of course, maybe it was some sort of, like, psyop from the CIA where they're like, oh, look, we have whistleblowers and all. It could be that. Right. But I always get this feeling when we, when we talk about, like, the NSA, the CIA, of a group of people that are really not as together and controlled as they claim. And I, I kind of saw that as another small piece of evidence, circumstantial, maybe to the idea that the CIA is just not even in control of its own body type of thing, you know? Well, I, I think I think that's a wise conclusion, and and I, I I agree with that conclusion, and I agree with it primarily. I've I've worked in Washington. I worked for the U.S. government for about three years, and 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 it was a good experience. And I worked I worked for about a year and a half in the in the Carter White House, and then I worked for a couple of agencies. But the one lesson. <laughs> The, I came away with many lessons, and I, I didn't have anything to do with the intelligence community. Uh, so, so uh, you know, I didn't have I didn't have exposure. But, but the lesson I came away from, and, and I think without doubt it applies to the intelligence community and the FBI and all other agencies, including mm-hmm. the Secret Service, is never underestimate the ineptness mm-hmm. of bureaucracy in government. Oh yeah. 
Oh yeah. They just, you know, these for the most part, these are people that go to work, you know, at eight or nine o'clock in the morning, and and then go home at four thirty or five o'clock, and and that's the end of it. And they make uh, you know, thirty, you know, forty thousand dollars a year. You yeah, know, yeah. Government and, salary. And a, and a and a good number of the and they work hard, but a good number of those people are are people in fairly key positions. Uh, that move paper or move information or or move let's use the word intelligence that that can be critical in certain situations uh yet yet you know a lot of things escape them, but the bottom line is never underestimate the ineptness of government i yeah. i I can think of a, a i know a lot of people in the conspiracy community in terms of of uh the Kennedy assassination make a lot of hay with the fact that some of the documents concerning Lee Harvey Oswald uh, prior to the assassination refer to Lee Harvey Oswald as Lee Henry Oswald. Uh, mm-hmm. And a lot of people have made, you know, made, you know, <laughs> made a lot of hay with that and, and mm-hmm. think, you know, that points in this direction or that points in that they direction. They never get a name wrong. But, but I can tell you, I, <laughs> exactly. You know, the, the I don't think a day went by when I didn't see a document <laughs> that didn't get a name wrong, I mean, or, that, name. or that did not have to be corrected with the with the appropriate first name, middle name, or even last name misspelled. Well, uh, so, thing- so to go bonkers when you see when you see you know. One or two documents with the name Lee Lee Henry Lee Henry Oswald. That's just you know it's absurd. It's well, it's actually absurd things. to think well that's you know that's a false trail. You know that's that's leading off in this direction. It's you know it's not. There there are secretaries, mm-hmm. low level secretaries that type these documents. Yeah. Uh, and they don't, you know, they work hard, but they don't always pay attention to detail. And a lot of people's handwriting is extremely hard to, to read. The fact that that didn't happen more often with Lee Harvey Oswald, to, I find astounding that there were mm-hmm. more mistakes in files uh, well, something dealing on that topic, with him. I think that there's, there's a concerted effort out there um, through media and through just even like the conspiracy community or what may be kind of be co-intel pro individuals is to attempt to paint the intelligence agencies as almost omnipotent. And certainly this happens mm-hmm. in like, you know, spy films. I mean, you know, it started mm-hmm. with, uh, what's his name? James Bond, you know, right. sort of this, he's good at everything, great at everything, has access to all these super awesome technical toys and stuff like that. It's this whole I think that a lot of the work maybe of the CIA actually goes into working to promote this image of themselves to cover up for the fact that, that they're not quite as competent as the movies portray them to be. And and the community kind of comes out with these really, really highly paranoid statements about mm-hmm. they 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 practically know what you're thinking before you think it or like they're listening <laughs> to you yeah. type. And they, they have computer programs that can predict what you're going to say based on what you type. And, of course, as a computer – uh, scientist, I consider that completely fundamentally ridiculous. It's just a completely mm. ridiculous statement. I mean, they they are not omnipotent, and um, at the same time, we're still left with the legacy of the leader of the free world shot dead in plain sight, mm-hmm. and the truth covered up for sixty years, fifty years. Well, uh, no, because uh, in a certain sense, I think somebody did a, a incompetent. I call it pretty confident. Well, I mean, it's just it's psychopathic reversive blockading because they did a study of how many people. I think it was something like seventy percent of people. I don't remember the exact don't number. Believe. Simply do not believe the official story and think that the government assassinated him. Yeah, but yeah I, think I mean, it is, like, I think it is at seventy percent now. But nobody, you know, a good reason. A, a good reason for that is Hollywood. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, it, 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 I, I think if you if you looked at that seventy percent alone. And asked what percentage of that seventy percent were led towards that belief by Oliver Stone's film. Yeah. It would probably mm-hmm. be at, at least fifty percent of mm-hmm. that seventy percent. Oh yeah. Uh, sure. And I think I think a lot of us psychologically fall into that trap. I I find myself just in terms of doing research when I think of. Characters like David Ferry, the image that almost immediately yeah. comes to mind 
is who is it? Joe Pesci in in the JFK yeah. movie. Yet David Ferry really didn't look anything like that at all. Maybe uh-huh. with the false hairpiece, but <laughs> but didn't act didn't act out like that. And and I think I think propaganda wise in in terms of Hollywood and not just Hollywood, but actually television today in the United States. I think the 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 intelligence agencies have a good hook into the entertainment industry because if you oh, see yeah. most most of the most of the entertainment that comes out of this country now while on the surface can be viewed as maybe anti intelligence establishment basically when you really examine it is is pro intelligence and really makes oh, the the intelligence absolutely. community look look quite good especially the, the <laughs> television shows that are that are extremely popular in this country. Oh yeah. Absolutely. So, anyway, be... so, on, so your point your point is your you know your point is a really good one. It's it's I don't know again it's it, the CIA and and the overall intelligence community and it's grown since 9/11 and you now actually have a director of national intelligence that's over the director of central intelligence. If anything, it's become an in, in, in even larger octopus, a larger beast uh, that mm-hmm. that I have no idea how anybody can manage it. And, and, mm-hmm. and incorporated into that now is it's the a, a Homeland Security drive. Administration, uh, mm-hmm. which has almost almost equal, if not greater, power domestically. Uh, and probably internationally, and and again, it goes to well, who's managing this? You know, mm-hmm. who, who, how often do these? You know, how, how often do they meet? Do they share information? And and the FBI is still out there uh, domestically doing its own thing. Internationally, also. Well, doing its I, own I consider thing. the FBI an intelligence agency too. I mean, it, it is well, really yeah, kind of. It, it, basi- yeah. it basically is today. Yeah. And, and in a lot of ways, it always has been. Yeah, uh, you know, domestically, it's it's always gathered intelligence, and it's and in a lot of ways, it's acted against the the greater interest of of the American public. I mean, if anything, the FBI was on the wrong side with the uh, the civil rights movement uh, yeah. in this country. I think that's you know that's a good example of how how a federal agency can interfere. Uh, with you know, with social to positive social change, and I think oh, yeah. the CIA was the CIA to to whatever extent was sharing information with them. Just uh, Hank, getting getting back to the um, we were talking about before about these kind of uh, doctors and psychiatrists who performed all of these horrible experiments on people, mm-hmm. uh, and what kind of what kind of human beings are they? I mean. I found it interesting in your, in your book, um, a, secret, uh, a Secret Order, um, the depiction of the various other people that were that you kind of suggest were in some way involved in the JFK assassination, uh, mm-hmm. specifically, um, what do you call him, uh, David Sanchez Morales, mm-hmm. and, and, and people like him who were CIA employees, <clears throat> but certainly not mm-hmm. necessarily that high up. But mm-hmm. those kind of people and the way you can describe them in your book, I mean, the only word that really comes to mind is that they're basically psychopaths, that they have no uh, they have no real concern for other human beings at all, you know? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, the, the other name that comes up a lot is obviously Sidney Gottlieb, and you've actually, you spoke to him, yes? Mm-hmm. You, you interviewed him? What kind yes, of guy I did. Was- I- I interviewed him twice, uh, about, oh, I think it was eight or nine months, maybe ten months before he died. Uh, I, I, what kind of guy was he? I, it was, initially, it was, it, was a, it was a strange experience. I was very apprehensive about interviewing him and probably postponed it. Oh, uh, I don't think there was wasn't a day that went by for two or three months where I didn't reach for the phone, and then I thought, no, I'll do it tomorrow. No, I'll do it tomorrow. Uh, it took me a number of months to to get his phone number, and and then to to actually arrange to interview him. I had to go through 
through his attorney because he was being sued uh, at the time in a MK Ultra related case, and so there were there were some ground rules that had to be set up. But to, to answer your question, it was it was a pretty uh, apart from the ground rules, which forbade the discussion of certain subjects. It was a pretty normal discussion. It was much like talking to any elderly man. His his voice mm-hmm. actually reminded me of my father's mm-hmm. voice. Uh, he was very open, uh, very personable. Uh, you know, I didn't. It wasn't like talking to a monster. Yeah. Uh, and I'm and I asked him. I asked him a number of blunt questions. I asked him. Uh, uh, I didn't put the entire interview in the book because not all of it was appropriate. But I asked, I think the second question I asked him was his reaction to be portrayed uh, worldwide as a as a monster. Uh, and I think I used one other term that I drew from a Counterpoint article. The somebody that referred to him as Doctor Doctor Horror or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he had a perfectly logical explanation, and again, it turned on people uh, from the outside not understanding uh, mm-hmm. his his worldview and what was going on in terms of the Cold War and blah 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but and and I don't mean to downplay his explanation because I honestly came away, and I knew I was dealing with a, a highly skilled manipulator. Uh, I, it actually came across as being a fairly honest answer. Of course, he'd had, you know, sixty years to convince himself. <laughs> yeah. uh, but but I think uh, towards the end of the conversation, towards the end of that answer during that conversation, I think there was some signs of remorse uh, in mm. terms of some of the things that had happened, and and he did acknowledge that he could understand, he could certainly understand how people did feel that way mm. uh but i think you know the the mind you know we all know the mind can play tricks on on people and and it's easy you know people do everybody does something they consider not right or terrible or horrible and and your mind has a way of of you know, self self just self justifying rationalizing that and i think that was some of what was going on with him but but I I also got the impression I was talking to a man who was very much in touch uh, with himself, felt comfortable in his own skin, and and was very very blunt and frank about certain subjects. He told me, and I th- I think I put this in the Olson book that he took that he himself took LSD. I think it was thirty mm. thirty times, times or more, yeah. thirty times, and this was on his own. He initially mm-hmm. took LSD under the the controls of the the CIA medical staff uh, in a hotel, and then again at the the Butler Hospital, which is the CIA medical facility. But uh, he went beyond that and took it at least twenty times on his own because he said he he really enjoyed the benefits of the yeah. drug in terms of expanding. You know his own mind and his own thinking. We didn't, and we didn't go into a lot of depth on that because I had. That was the first interview, and I had like fourteen or fifteen questions to get through, and we had only set set aside an hour. But I thought that was remarkable, and I asked him if he, he if he'd ever had a bad experience with a drug, and he said no. That mm. that every every time was actually very positive. Uh, I just find. I just find it hard to believe that someone like him who can have overseen so many experiments on people who didn't know they were being experimented on, and certainly many of them that had uh, very traumatic experiences, how Mm -hmm. even after the first or second one, I mean, it's hard to justify that without there being something essential lacking. No, you're absolutely right, And 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 it certainly points to the fact, here's a man who's done LSD 20 or 30 times, and is certainly well well aware of the effects and what can happen. Who can't step out of his, out of himself for a moment and say, "Okay, what if I didn't know 
what was happening here. Yeah. What if I had been given this drug unwittingly? Uh, you know, and I'm driving down the street, and suddenly, suddenly, you know, the drug takes effect. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I it, it just sort of underscored perhaps how out of touch uh, he was in terms of, you know, a lot of the human subjects. But I think, I think, and I'm not a psychologist, but I think that that goes to just the mind of a bureaucrat. And mm -hmm. I think he certainly was a bureaucrat, and he was, you know, an administrator. And in most of these most of these sub projects that he oversaw, he had very very little contact with. He knew exactly what was going on, and mm -hmm. he signed he signed off on everything that happened under MK Ultra. So there's no excuses in that regard. Mm. But uh, but you know he commanded a, a fairly small staff of about twenty twenty five people. Who who actually went in the field and and oversaw this stuff, uh, you know, on a weekly and monthly basis, and I and I tried to hard. I tried to interview a number of those people, but they wouldn't talk at all. I also found it yeah I found it kind of interesting as well though that and maybe a little bit ominous that after he retired, him and his wife spent uh, eighteen months running a leper hospital in in India. India. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think I mean, and we talked a little bit about that. I asked him I was curious to know if that was true. Uh mm -hmm. because it had been reported in a number of places and, and it was true. His his wife his wife's name was Margaret and I believe she's still alive. Uh she was like Frank Olson's wife, the daughter of a an Episcopalian minister and a fairly religious woman, so but I didn't. Mm. I, we didn't get into any discussion about, you know, her knowledge or, or her right, feelings, Captain. her emotions about what what he did. I'm I'm sure she knew, and and I don't know if she knew at the time. She certainly knew after the fact, mm. uh, from all the the media exposure. But I would guess the the time in India was sort of penance <laughs> on his yeah. part perhaps i don't well, know i hope i Good. hope so because someone with yeah. his background going to india a continuation uh i would i would just not want to be a leper in india uh, with him <laughs> on the... well i mean i would right. i would i would make a small observation i mean the way that you kind of describe this guy is like a textbook description of what every single psychologist who has ever interviewed a psychopath will say exactly about them that they're not these horrible uh, boogeymen, uh, these yeah, monsters, that's true. you know? that's true. They really are. Yep. You they, you know, they, to... they come across as an, an actual person, and and they are. I mean, they are. And, to, and again, they... they've had all this time to, to self-justify what they've done, but... Uh, or, to, or to practice that mask that they wear mm -hmm. in a certain sense. I think mm -hmm. it's like what... Uh, uh, what's the name? Arendt said yeah. of Eichmann, the, the banality, banality of evil. evil. Exactly the same thing well, I thought. Eich Gottlieb, Eichmann's just a bureaucrat. Yeah, Gottlieb was an interesting case in terms of of, of what happened to him vis-a-vis -vis the CIA. He he actually was thrown to the wolves, and there's no doubt about that. At at some level, when when all this all this material and information uh, initially started to leak out. Uh, and, and hit the media. There was a decision. There was certainly a decision made at a high level in the CIA that look, we need a scapegoat. Somebody's mm -hmm. got to, you know, somebody's got to be put out there to be a target. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, it was going to be the DCI himself, or mm -hmm. or the assistant DCI, or or Helms, or someone that was going to be the target. And so Gottlieb's name was deliberately leaked to the media mm -hmm. uh, when when the MK Ultra stuff was coming out. And so, bingo, they had their target right away, and the media fell for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody zeroed in on Gottlieb and no one else. Because they, they don't was, remember... Which was amazing. They don't remember the, the rules about misdirection. You know, you right. always look in the opposite, opposite direction that the hand is pointing. You know, exactly. you never look at what they're pointing to. Um, exactly, well, and and Gottlieb, and I don't know if you recall or not, Gottlieb was called before Congress. 
I think on three or four occasions, and, and his testimony is available. I think most of it's reproduced on on the internet verbatim mm-hmm. uh, in all these congressional reports, and and he supposedly was grilled extensively, but but mm-hmm. if you really read it, and you don't have to read between the lines, it wasn't a grilling at all. Uh, no. You know, there wasn't any hard questioning whatsoever, and yeah. nobody ever asked him. Well, you know, I mean, he was he was the uh, he was the director of a very small component within a a CIA division called the Technical Services Division, um, and and he directed while MK Ultra was was being played out, uh, what was called the Chemical Division, the Chemical Branch, initially of the Technical Services. Uh, Division. The Technical Services Division was a very expansive division of the of the agency that had multiple arms. It had a chemical division. Mm-hmm. It had a biological division that Gottlieb had nothing to do with. It had a radiological division that Gottlieb had nothing to do with. It had uh, a documents division, and I don't know. It had thirteen or fourteen divisions, which means that Gottlieb had numerous superiors between himself and and the actual DCI, Alan Dulles. Dulles knew, we know from documents that Dulles knew exactly what was going on in terms of MKUltra, but Ghali was reporting through multiple personages uh, mm. before anything got, to, got to, uh, to Dulles. But were any of those people called before Congress? No. None of, of those not. people, and those those were the people. Those weren't just the people that were that Gottlieb was answering to. Those were the people that were directing Gottlieb. In other words, mm. it wasn't Gottlieb that said, "Okay, let's give let's give a subcontract to uh, to Harvard University." As a matter of fact, Gottlieb hated Harvard University, but somebody above Gottlieb said, "Okay, you know, some of this money's got to go towards go, go towards Harvard." Well, why? You know, and, and none of those questions were ever were ever posed to to Gottlieb or anybody above him, uh, just in terms of the MK Ultra program. And, well, no, and if you read all that testimony, you'll see that nobody ever asked the sixty four thousand dollar question, being what 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 was your question that started this interview? Well, what happened after MK Ultra? What's going mm-hmm. on now, Mr. Gottlieb, mm-hmm. in your estimation? Right. That question was never posed to him. Well, I mean, congressional hearings are sort of, generally speaking, kind of like farces as a, as a general rule. They're, you know, they're dog and, and be- pony shows. Yeah. Yeah. They're dog the and pony shows, and everything everything's rehearsed and, and pre-scripted, mm-hmm. and, and uh, <laughs> you know, everybody knows beforehand exactly what's going to be said, and Congress people sit up there and... They ask the question that's you know they ask the questions that that are going to make them good look good to their constituents and to the television cameras and to the nightly news. But but if you look at MK Ultra alone, I mean there was all this feigned outrage on the part of all the members of these congressional uh, committees. Uh, but what happened? Yeah, you know nothing. after it was over, nothing. Well, nothing. Not, you know, absolutely not nothing. On that point, for example, the Rockefeller Commission that basically, you know, investigated the CIA on MKL activities, mm-hmm. um, you know, this was an example of that because Nelson Rockefeller, he was actually involved at quite far back in the towards the beginning with LSD research. So the idea yeah, that he, he was, was tw- he, twenty years he later involved. be going, oh wow, he was signing what have you been doing? He, he he signed off on a lot of the experiments that involved uh, the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, because he was head of that agency and uh, for a while, surprise. and that and that never came out in any of the hearings. Uh, you can kidding. actually see see documents where where he was very much involved. Yeah. yeah, that's like that's like putting Alan Dulles on the Warren Commission. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and if, you, and if you look deeper, you'll see that the Rockefeller Foundation uh, and the Rockefeller Institute in New York City were very, very much involved yeah. in MK Ultra, and were very, very much involved in a lot of horrendous uh, <clears throat> experimentation 
and operations that were going on in Latin and South America, and and that was just completely overlooked. It seems. Oh, go ahead. It, yeah, yeah. Previously, we were mentioning two uh, goals uh, that seems mutually exclusive. Uh, on one side, uh, sadistic activities, making uh, unwilling patients suffering for nothing, basically. On the other side, trying to uh, create Manchurian candidates. Mm -hmm. control. So mm -hmm. uh, sadism on one side and control on the other side. It might not be this mutually exclusive because uh, control and enjoying the suffering of, of others are one of the two main traits of uh, psychopathic minds. Mm, yeah. mm -hmm. So I guess for the ones who had this psychological profile, it was all benefits. Uh, they, they were getting this patient suffering hips and at the same time they uh, could ex exert control on them. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that could answer a lot, you know. I mean, just the idea of uh, the people to actually carry out these experiments and and, and to push them just enjoyed uh, dominating and controlling and 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 harming other people. They got off on it, if you want to put well, it that I way. Well, I mean, yeah. there, there's there's another case we haven't touched on yet. What happened in France in the small yeah. village of Pont Saint Well, Saint well mm -hmm. did you you actually kind of broke that story. Hank, right? Mm -hmm. To a certain extent. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was on yes. the uh, on in the web on the BBC. It was um, mm -hmm. uh, basically. I was reading. I was actually reading the the BBC report the other day, um, where uh, where it just explained what went on. And uh, you also mentioned though that um, I mean, maybe maybe we should just explain, or you can explain yeah. what 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 actually happened at Pont Saint Esprit. That was in 1950. 51 and how did it 1951 involve? August yeah. August of 1951 and and there's a it, it's amazing I a couple months ago I went back and looked at uh I don't know 20 or 30 articles related to my book uh, concerning Pont Saint Esprit and there's a fair amount there there's actually a large amount of misinformation now uh concerning what I allegedly said about that did did the experiment actually occur? Absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind whatsoever now. Uh, and there was none when I wrote the book, but there's there's a lot of additional information that's come in since then. But but a couple things that need to be corrected is a lot of people claim uh, that I said it was an aerosol uh, attack or experiment, and and I did not say that. Uh, it, as far as I know, it was not an aerosol attack that was that was uh, carried out through airplanes. I think the the bread itself was infected, uh, and probably at the point of origin before it was delivered to the you know various in households Baker. and door, doorsteps in uh, in Pont Saint Esprit. Well, I don't. I have no idea whether or not the baker was complicit in the experiment. I personally I doubt it. I don't I don't think it was necessary for the baker to actually be involved. Uh it would have been easy to get to that bread after the fact after it was baked. Mm -hmm. uh, or even before but, because and, they And then a lot of people a lot of people point the finger at the CIA as as having been the agency or the the entity that conducted the experiment. I never said that either. It was actually the US Army and it was the hmm. army, and it was with. I mean, the the CIA was complicit in the experiment, but it was the army that actually carried it out. Hmm. Uh, what I've a, a question a lot of people raise in terms of having doubts about the experiment is why would the why would the U.S. government pick that you know a, a French village to attack? Well, as it turns out, it it politically that village was very much on the outs with the French government at that point in time. And I guess uh, Charles de Gaulle, and, and perhaps one of you would know this a lot better than I, uh, really didn't have any fondness whatsoever for that village. And in terms of the documents that emerged, and these were CIA documents uh, concerning the army experiment, uh, the the... The, that village was specifically picked uh, because of the because of the fact that they were on the outs with the French government. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Can, can and, you explain what you mean? That that's actually news to us. What 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 was it about this village politically that made it a target? Polit- politically, there were a number of people that were considered uh, pro-communist in mm-hmm. Saint Esprit, ah. and and that had and and a number of the prominent politicians in Pont Saint Esprit. Uh, there was friction between De Gaulle. And and the political the political machine in Po Saint Esprit. So it would have been, you know, if if the French government had been involved in the experiment. And according to the one CIA document I have concerning a conversation between a CIA informant and uh, Sandos of uh, Sandos chemical official, uh, that was the fact that that it was selected because of that reason. Uh, and then the main thing being the Sandos official saying uh, to the CIA informant that it was an experiment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and uh, perhaps you might just outline what happened. Well, uh, just for our listeners, yeah. Yeah. Well, what ha- what happened in a nutshell was that they, they <laughs> in 1951, bread was very fresh baked bread was a staple in the French diet as it is today, mm-hmm. uh, but it was delivered. To the doorstep in most villages, as as fresh milk was in the United States in in the early 50s, and the bread that was developed, the, the bread that was delivered to that village was infected uh, with an LSD-like drug. Was it, was it specifically LSD? Nobody knows. According to the documents, it was referred to as LSD, but at that point in time. Uh, Sandoz Chemical, uh, being the the company where where the where the drug came from that infected the drug, that infected the bread, uh, was experimenting with a number of chemicals, LSD like chemicals. So so I have never said specifically that it was LSD, but it was very much an LSD type drug. That w- that was used to infect the, uh, the to infect the bread, and what happened was that uh, after the bread is del- delivered, four or five hours after the bread was delivered and consumed by five or six hundred people at least in the villages, you had a massive hysterical outbreak of uh, of uh, LSD or, or psychochemical induced psychosis. In the mm-hmm. village, and, and people ran amok for for about a day. There were three or four alleged oh. suicides, and a number of people got carted off to to I think local uh, or not Insane. local, but nearby insane mm-hmm. asylums, maybe in Marseilles or or wherever. But that was it in a nutshell. And uh, and initially, and and when I when I researched the Olson book. I knew nothing about Pont Saint Esprit. I had read about the incident maybe ten years prior to that, and and bought into the conventional explanation uh, that it was infected, uh, that it was a raw year got that it that it mm-hmm. naturally infected it the goes, bread, and, yeah. and that you know that made sense to me. Although I do remember initially thinking, well, you know, why didn't that ha- happen more often? Why why just mm-hmm. this one instance? Uh, but I had, point out you know, I had no clue that 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 had anything to do with the Olson case until I started interviewing people, and there were a number of cryptic or ominous references to uh, "quote unquote" what happened in France, and mm-hmm. and wow, well, you should look into what happened in France, and and I was still confused and and wasn't really thinking in terms. Specific terms about Pont Saint Esprit until I came across uh, this one document, uh, two-page document where where the incident was discussed in detail at a meeting in New York City between uh, an unnamed official. I'm I'm pretty sure I have the name now, but I, I don't want to use it until I'm 100% sure. An unnamed Sandos official who was meeting with a CIA. Informant, uh, and they had a long, over dinner. They had a long conversation about Pont Saint Esprit, 
And the Sandoz official said, well, you know, you know as well as I know it was not an accident and had nothing to do with infected bread and that it was an experiment, quote unquote. Hmm. Uh, and, and then they went into a fair amount of detail. And it, at that point, I started researching the actual incident. And, and within hours, or maybe within days, it, it took me a while to get a copy of Fuller's book. John Fuller wrote a book called St. Anthony's Fire about it, but uh, found out fairly quickly that the two, in, the two primary investigators that were sent in by the French government uh, to, to see what the hell was happening in the village uh, were both from the Sandoz Chemical uh, Corporation, wow. which was nearby. And one of them was Albert Hoffman, uh, mm-hmm. who had actually, who had actually, who was credited with discovering LSD. Although it was mm-hmm. basically, I think it was his superior who actually discovered it ten years beforehand. But they went in to investigate and and said, "Wow, it's infected bread. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's not it's not any kind of you know attack or or chemical compound that was surreptitiously used on these people." Well, in in August of 1951, Sandoz Chemical had been sitting on LSD for for approximately two or three years, and was actively supplying the drug to the CIA and the U.S. Army, and was mm-hmm. was strongly pressuring them. You know what they were trying to. And when I say they were actively supplying, I mean they were basically giving the drug to the Army and the CIA. In hopes that they would make money from it, and that mm-hmm. the and that the army or the or or the CIA or both would come up with some sort of effective use where they would buy large supplies from Sandoz. So, it, and it, if you look at all the the media or the newspaper reports, there there was basically no television back then. Uh, you'll see that nobody nobody was cognizant of that. In 1951, and Hoffman and and the the investigator that went with him made no mention of the fact. You know, this what's happening to these people is is exactly what happens in the experiments that we've conducted in various mental institutions in mm-hmm. Switzerland. Uh, and and in those same experiments that they conducted, there were suicides. In, in the mental institutions as a result of their drug experimentation that have been covered up and have since since uh, that time emerged in, in overall LSD literature. But they made no mention of the fact that, oh, by the way, we at Sandoz Chemical have a drug that just happens to reproduce these effects almost identically to what happened here in Pont Saint Esprit. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> what a coincidence! And then from that point forward, for about two years, every time every time I would interview uh, a scientist who had worked with Olson at Fort Detrick, I would, you know, try to try to bring up France, and immediately, with most people, would run into a brick wall. And would have to, you know, skirt around it. But it became more than obvious that something had happened in France. Uh, and then eventually, I spoke to a couple of people who told me, "Yeah, that's, you know, that was part of the Olson story, and that was part and parcel of what Olson was talking about uh, in terms of wanting to leave work at the Special Operations Division at Fort Detrick and and retra- retrain himself as a dentist. Uh, believe it or not." Uh, but wanting to get away from getting, you know, get away from from uh, chemical and biological research for Dietrich. So it seems that Olson had a a guilty conscience about what happened in France. I'm not. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. A lot. A lot of people make that claim. I never made that claim in the book because I, I was never able to document Olson. Olson was a fairly a fairly arrogant individual and and by all accounts and, and and I mean all accounts everyone I spoke to that knew him uh disliked him on one level or another uh 
because of his arrogance and and outspokenness. And and I think where Olson made his fatal mistake was that when he made when he made the firm decision to leave work, to leave his employment uh, at Fort Detrick, uh, he he was a little too outspoken about mm-hmm. some of the some of the some of the things that that some of the activities that he was well aware of and that mm-hmm. was the reason that was the reason he was taken to deep creek lake uh and was dosed with LSD or or whatever he was dosed with the mm-hmm. record shows that it was it was LSD but that was basically an interrogation mm-hmm. to do a damage assessment on mm-hmm. on How much on we, his potential yeah. Mm-hmm. On his How potential, and, and and if you think, in terms of you know the the Pont Saint Esprit incident was 1951, but you know two years later in 1953, if if any reports, if any you know firm reports had come out in 1953, mm-hmm. uh, this at the you know the height of the Cold War that the American government had had <laughs> launched a chemical attack on a French village. The Soviets would have would have had a heyday with that. Yeah, I mean it would have it would have been it would have been you know the the impact would have been unmeasurable. I mean, it would, yeah, I mean, just would have been unbelievable. So France was a friendly country, right? So a very friendly country. Very I mean, France was. Country. There's no reason to do that against France if they would do that against nope. France. Uh, <laughs> I mean, obviously nope. they couldn't justify it as as you know. I mean, if nope. they did it against, are you still there, Frank? But the thing oh, that's Hank? interesting, and, and I guess we don't have time to go into it now, but the the, the involvement in terms of uh, LSD experimentation uh, w- by French scientists and the CIA was very, very extensive. For whatever reason, there were a number of, of fairly prominent French researchers uh, who were very, very interested in LSD. Uh, and uh, and we're working very closely with uh, a number of the scientists, both directly affiliated with the CIA and directly affiliated uh, later on with MK Ultra uh, experiments. Uh, Jeanne Delay was the I, th- I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly D E L A Y, but was perhaps the most uh, prominent of, of French scientists and. And I'm still digging into that. And there's there were a couple lawsuits uh, in the last 12 years that that uh, uh, resurrected some interesting information concerning uh, things going on in France uh, in the early 50s, uh, in in part and parcel to what the U.S. Army and the CIA was doing. So it looks like there was. Beyond Pont Saint Esprit, there was there was some interesting experimentation that was going on in France. Hello. Hello? Thank you. All right, so we're back. Hello? Hello. <clears throat> Maybe he hung up. I don't know. Are we back? Can people hear us? Um, let me see if I can... Ah, no, we're not back yet. No, we're, we, we I are, think we are, we are back, but we're not uh, have to recall him again. Uh, Hello. I was just 
Uh, hi. Uh, we got hi, cut sir. off, huh? <laughs> yeah, we just, we just, I don't know, it's, it's the NSA. Uh, the G- the, <laughs> no, it, was our, it was our Skype connection. There was nothing wrong with our net connection. For some reason, Skype just kind of cropped out on us and wouldn't oh. uh, wouldn't reconnect. But um, we can edit that out. <laughs> sure, uh, can. Edit that space out. Um, what were we talking about? Well, we're talking about Post Saint-Esprit. Post Saint-Esprit and the afternoon. I got to I got to run anyway. I I'm supposed oh, to be somewhere at 4:30. So Okay, well that's not Because right. I thought we were going to stop at 4 anyway, right? Yeah, we were. We just yeah. didn't want to stop that way. <laughs> well, if you want to if if you want, you can email we can maybe pick back up uh at another time in a few sure, days yeah. or yeah, yeah, we can do another show, yeah. And okay. We can, we can do yeah. Our, but That's anyway, a great idea. Um, thanks for being on, Hank. I just want to tell okay. you. Okay, yeah, I enjoyed it. It was fun. Okay. Thank you, Hank. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, sir. Take, Take care. care. Bye-bye. Bye. Have Bye. a nice day. All right, folks, that was uh, a bizarre end to this week's show. That was the, there end, you go. the end of but, part one. Yeah, but um, yeah, we just want to recommend these books by uh, by Hank Alberelli Jr., uh, A Secret Order, and... Um, a, terrible, a, terrible, a Terrible Mistake. A terrible Mistake. Both of them are very... I mean, they basically provide the, the Secret Order one around uh, uh, um, what do you call him, Oswald, and all of the people associated with him his entire life over, you know, him being in, in, in Russia and afterwards and his association around the the Kennedy assassination just provide a, a picture that it's just so bizarre and so so weird and mm-hmm. unlikely that it it kind of is very it doesn't provide any evidence necessarily for who did you know that JFK was assassinated not by Oswald that or that Oswald did not assassinate JFK but it provides so much evidence around him with in terms of his life and the people that interacted with him and where he was and what he did that it makes it extremely implausible that he was just a simple lone uh, gunman uh-huh. with, a, with, a, with, a, with a problem with the president or that he was a commie sympathizer who wanted to, to kill the president. So, and in the other book, A Terrible Mistake about this guy, Frank Olson, he basically concludes that he can show Albert has shown that no, it was not a suicide, which many people have known over the years, but it's been constantly covered up. This doctor was supposed to have thrown himself out of a closed window Olsen can show, I'm oh, sorry, Alborelli can show that he was thrown out, pitched at the window. Yep. He can also name who did it. Two people of French ours, and funnily enough, we talked briefly about French assassins, and they comes mm-hmm. up again in this case, mm-hmm. threw him out the window. The names were Pierre Lafitte and François Merd. <laughs> no, his name escapes me. His name was Merd. François Spirito, I think, or something like that. Yeah, well, but they were, they were two people who were used as hitmen yeah. in a number of cases, well, and they were present there yes. that day. And so, Lafitte was actually, I think, was 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 the guy who might have been in in Dallas. Uh, he might have I'm been. I'm not sure. He might have been. Yeah. Uh, He's the French, the French, the French, the French assassin. Yeah. Yeah. Should, he was just descended just from up. the famous yeah, we're pirate. Just we're wrapping it up next, uh, next time. Yeah, we're just we're just wrapping it up here. Um. It's, uh, yeah, well, in terms of Olsen, because we didn't really talk about Olsen very much here, but uh, just to give people who are hearing his name, I mean, he was obviously thrown out. He, Olsen was an entry. Olsen was a, a biologist who was involved in this MK Ultra kind of research, and it was an entry into this whole world of MK Ultra mm-hmm. for Alborelli because of the weirdness around his death. He supposedly jumped out of uh, this 13-story uh, window when... Uh, in a New York hotel. Yeah, for no reason, mm-hmm. and... It was a strange event, it was a strange death, so you look into it and you find out what he was doing and then you follow on from that. And even in uh, 1994, his family had his body exhumed and found that there were uh, injuries to his head and his chest that were not consistent with the fall from the window. So that's basically Olsen. So that, Olsen is like a gateway into the whole uh, area of yeah. uh, MK Ultra and mind control. Is this like a thing that, that a lot of researchers into MK Ultra know about? Because I never heard of this guy. He, Michael, no. Well, it's, it's pretty famous now. He, he yeah. is, yeah. He, he is well known. His case is well known. This is why this, his case is particularly well known. He, on paper, he's just another guy who was bumped off. But 
in a long it's line. what he was doing. It's what he was doing and, and what it would expose what explains was, the extent of the effort they went to cover it up. What was he doing? He was directly involved in the MK Ultra Mankalo research with LFD and all sorts yeah, of things. We have established that it was so massively huge that I don't know. Like, what, what, does, does it say anything about what he was really doing? It, well, he was involved in, in dosing he, people. His, he, his particular field of speciality was to develop um, ways to deliver these substances through oh, a city's water supply, through aerosols, through special gadgets. They would like some of the infamous cases of giving a, a wetsuit to Castro to try and bump them off, and they would poison the, the inside of the wetsuit. Obviously, a number of these things did not come to fruition or did not work, but he was involved in the brains of coming up with ways to deliver these right. drugs mm-hmm. uh, and or poisons. Um, yeah. He was anyway. involved in a lot more, but... Anyway, there was that's, a threat we, that he was going to spill the beans or something? Pretty much. I that's think, what he said. Yes. He was given LSD. He was, uh, he nine was days before his death, he was sorry. given LSD was, as, a, as part of an interrogation to find out basically what he would, would do because he wanted out of the job he was in. He wanted to leave right. them. So they took him, gave him LSD, interrogated him, found out whether or not he would spill the beans, figured he would. Then they put him in a, in a hotel room and threw him out the window. <laughs> well, you know, I mean... Growing up around, you know, during during the 90s with gang culture, they had these two philosophies in, in local gangs. If you wanted to join a gang, you had to do something called getting beat in. And if you wanted to leave the gang, you had to join, you had to do something called getting beat out, which is basically that uh, they have to kick your butt. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's really bad, and, and several people have actually died from it. And it seems that the CIA does something similar. When they recruit you, they vet you by torturing you, and when you leave, they torture you to make sure you're not going to talk. And mm-hmm. Pretty much. It just sounds like a gigantic organized gang, a gang. to me. Well, that's, gang that's, a good, that's a good enough description. Anyway, folks, thanks for listening. We're going to uh, leave it there for this week. We will be back next week with uh, with another show, but probably it'll be something along the lines of All and Everything, which will be a, a general discussion on what's been going on in the news. If not, though, you will be able to inform yourselves of what is on next week during the week on our website and on our forum. So, until then, thanks for listening, and see you later. Over and out. Bye-bye.